Okay, Kim 111 guys, we've got an exam coming up very soon, and so um, I've got another set of practice problems here that I hope will help build your confidence and get you kind of ready to do your best on that exam and, and hopefully clarify anything that might be confusing by going through what I would consider problems that are going to be very similar, at least in format and in terms of uh, the concepts covered for the exam coming up. So let's go ahead and dive right in and, and solve these and hopefully get you ready for that exam. So this first one says, write the products and balance the reaction below and so uh, don't forget to include the phases of matter and this first one we've got some kind of hydrocarbon this is butane it's not important that you know that but you're reacting with oxygen whenever you react something with pure oxygen that's probably a good indicator or a good hint that it's a combustion reaction and so here when you have a complete combustion reaction your products are always going to be the same thing and they're going to be water and I don't care you could say liquid or gas doesn't really matter since it's going to be hot probably gas and then finally carbon dioxide and that is definitely a gas so there you go there are your two products now we gotta balance it well you could look at this and say okay well here's butane right it's the most complicated thing so I would have four carbons here so I have four carbons over here and that would be right and then here you're gonna run into a problem you have ten hydrogens which okay no big deal you divide that by two because there are two in water and you can say it's gonna be five well, the problem is that if you have five oxygens, you're kind of stuck because you have O2 as a unit and there's no way you're going to get an odd number, right? Because you can't have an odd number as a factor of two. So in this case, we're going to have to double this guy, which brings the carbons. Two times four is eight, which means we're going to have eight carbon dioxides. And we've got, what, 20, <laughs> 20 hydrogens. So that's going to give us 10 waters, right? So now if we look at that, we say, okay. Now we've got, what do we have here? We've got 16 O's here, and we've got 10 over here, so that's 26 divided by 2. I believe that gives us a 13. So that's kind of, a, those numbers are kind of high, but it looks balanced to me. If you get high numbers, it's always worth taking a moment to see if there's any way you could divide all the numbers by a common factor to get a reduced you know kind of lowest common multiple but here if we were divided by 2 you can't divide 13 by 2 evenly so this is what our answer looks like and, and that's a combustion reaction over here we've got an acid right sulfuric acid is one of your strong acids uh, potassium hydroxide is a strong base so strong acid strong base that kind of gives you a hint that this is a neutralization reaction kind of like the ones you did in lab so for neutralization, you're always going to get water as one of your products, right? And in this case, I'm going to write water as a liquid. And then finally, you're going to get some kind of salt. And here you have potassium and sulfate. So my salt that I'm going to have here is probably going to be K2SO4. And you can look on your table and all potassium salts are soluble. So that's going to be aqueous. Now, real quickly, you'll see that since we had to double the potassium to balance the charge for sulfate, that automatically puts a two over here. And if we've got two OHs and two acidic hydrogens, that's gonna give us two waters. And then we can put a one here to clarify. And then there we go, that's a balanced uh, neutralization reaction. Not, not too tough. Um, going to the next one, uh, this is a limiting reagent problem. But before we get to that point, we wanna do the, the first couple steps where we have to balance the net ionic equation. So I kinda bring this down. Uh, magnesium is a solid. It definitely does not uh, dissociate or break up. So we just write that one as given, right? So it's gonna be, um, now you might wanna be tempted to say that's gonna be a two, but you have to be careful, right? That is not a two plus, right? Cause that's not a salt. That's just a chunk of magnesium, kind of like what you dealt with in lab, right? A piece of magnesium ribbon. And a solid neutral piece of metal is gonna have a zero oxidation state. So solid metal, remember that's gonna be a zero oxidation state. Don't get confused. Uh, the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna say, okay, this HCl, that is a strong acid, so that will completely dissociate, and that's gonna give you two H pluses, right? And since it's dissolved, it's gonna be aqueous. And then, of course, you also have two Chloride, chlorides there, right? So that's going to be aqueous as well. And then it brings us over here. Now we've already told you that that's aqueous, so that's soluble. So that must dissociate, and that's going to give you, in this case, you're going to have magnesium 2 plus. And that's really important distinction from the other side in the reactants. And then finally, don't forget there are two chlorides. So we need to make sure and write two chloride, and that's an aqueous. And then finally, that H, H2, that's hydrogen gas that's just simply going to be H2 
gas because gases don't dissociate on their own. Now we look at this and we say, okay, well, this is really important that you notice what is on both sides that has not changed. And so magnesium zero is not, repeat, not the same as magnesium two plus. You cannot uh, cancel those because one's a solid and one's aqueous. They're not the same. Two hydrogen pluses is not the same as hydrogen gas. You cannot cancel those. However, two chloride aqueous and two chloride aqueous, those are identical and you can cancel them. So you end up having a net ionic reaction of magnesium solid plus two H plus gives you magnesium two plus and some hydrogen gas. And I believe that's nice and balanced, right? Two hydrogens, two hydrogens, one magnesium, one magnesium. Even the charge is balanced, right? There's two one, two one pluses and one two plus. So everything is balanced and that looks really good. Um, for the next one, this is kind of your standard limiting reagent problem, but there's a little twist, right? Here, I'm asking you for the volume, not the mass, the volume of hydrogen gas, right? So we've got a gas here and we can use PV equals NRT from last unit to calculate that. So what are we gonna be looking for? Well, I'm gonna be looking for the moles of hydrogen gas so I can convert it to volume as the question asks. However, I am given both the amount of magnesium and the volume of an aqueous solution. So I need to figure out what is the highest number of moles I can make. Again, this is another way of saying what is the, the theoretical yield I could get. And so here we go. Let's do the easy one first. I'm gonna take the 3.25 grams of magnesium metal, and I'm gonna divide that by the uh, formula weight of, or the molecular weight of 24.305, right? That's gonna be grams of magnesium, and I got that from the periodic table for every one mole of magnesium metal, right? Now I've got moles of magnesium, so I would look up here on the, the, I typically use the molecular equation because it tells me the compounds, not the ions. So I've got one mole of magnesium, right? One mole of magnesium and there's one mole of hydrogen gas. And if I crank that out and everything cancels, grams cancel, moles cancel, I'm left with moles hydrogen, I get something on the order of 0.1, three, four moles of H2. And I could stop there, but some of you like to go ahead and carry it on to, to mass, that's fine. So we can multiply this by what? Uh, one mole of H2 gas has a uh, molecular weight of about 2.02 grams of hydrogen. And if you wanna take it all the way to mass, I think I get something like 0 0.270 grams of excuse me of hydrogen right there we go that's important mistake there so that would be if all the magnesium reacted that is the highest amount the largest amount of magnesium mass I could get or you could look at the moles for the next one we've actually got a solution so we do things a little bit differently we've got 1.50 and whenever you see a, a molarity I always write it as moles over liters because I think that helps me track where I need to go next in my calculation. So I have moles HCl over liters of HCl solution. Now I wanna get rid of these liters because I want moles, right? Because whenever you get a doubt, right? You always wanna go to moles because when you have moles, you can compare. So in this case, I wanna get to moles, so I need to cancel liters. And I know that 250 milliliters is the same as 0.2 five zero liters of HCl, right? So those cancel. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to write the units. They can help you so much. And in this case, I have what? I have two moles of HCl for every one mole of hydrogen gas. And if I crank out that calculation, I get 0 0.188 moles of hydrogen gas. Now right away you can tell that the magnesium is our limiting reagent because it gives us the smallest amount of um, product. So we are limited, our limiting reagent is magnesium because it limits how much hydrogen product we can produce. If we could make this much, we would need more magnesium, but we run out at 3.25 and once you run out, you, you stop right here. So that is the maximum amount you could get. That's our theoretical yield. So you don't need to go any further with that. But what we can do now is we can take this value and we can answer the original question. We can say PV 
equals an RT, and we want to solve for volume, right? And we're, we have the moles up here. So let's go ahead and solve this for volume in terms of everything else. And that's pretty simple. So we take our moles, right? It was 0 0.134 moles of hydrogen. Now R is the gas constant, and I would give that to you, 0 0.0821. And the units are just as important here liters ATM over moles times Kelvin and then temperature now be really careful I kinda tricked you here I put 25 degrees C you have to convert that to Kelvin and how do you know well you have to look at the units of the gas constant that's really important so 273 plus 25 I think that's 298 Kelvin right not degrees Kelvin there's no such thing as degrees Kelvin it's just 298 Kelvin and then in this case it's 1 ATM that's our pressure, that's easy enough, 0, 1.00 atmospheres. And if I crank that out, I think I get something along the lines of 3.28 liters of hydrogen gas. That's the answer to the question. Now, if we go down here a little bit further, we'll say, okay, well, let's assume that we actually do this reaction and we get you know, a quarter of a gram of hydrogen gas. Well, that's easy, we can find the percent yield. That's really, really simple. Percent yield, right, is nothing more than a ratio of what you actually get over what you theoretically could get times 100 percent, right? And so we can crank that out. If we actually get 0 0.250 grams of hydrogen gas, and you go up above and you look where I can convert it to grams, I got point. 270 grams of hydrogen gas. That's the most I could get in theory based on my calculation. If I crank that out, I get something like 92.6% yield, which would actually be a quite nice of a quite nice yield. I mean, that would that would be a really impressive accomplishment if you could get 90% yield every time. That would be cool. So there you go. First page done. All right, next page. Uh, this one is a really neat problem. I, I think it's pretty cool. It relates back to your 10 test tube lab, uh, thinking about what things can precipitate. And so I look at this and I say potassium iodide plus lead nitrate. These are double displacement reactions, right? Uh, potassium nitrate would be one product, but you know that potassium salts are all soluble. So the other one's more important. I would get uh, lead PBI2. And that one, you can look on your table of solubilities, right? And lead iodide is indeed a precipitate. It is not soluble. If you look here, you're going to get sodium sulfide plus calcium chloride. Well, that would be sodium chloride, which we know is soluble, so we don't worry about sodium salts. But you're going to get this calcium sulfide, right? And you have to look here, and you see that sulfides are pretty insoluble. However, calcium is the exception. It is soluble, so there's no precipitate there. And again, you'll be given that table of solubility, so please be able to use that. And then here we've got what? We'll have ammonium acetate as one, and barium sulfate is probably the one we should look at, right? All acetates are soluble, so I'm not going to spend my time worried about acetate. And so here you see barium sulfate, and if you look at barium sulfate, it is, most sulfates are soluble, but barium sulfate is not soluble, so you will get a precipitate there. Again, that's kind of just can you use a solubility table? or not. Okay, so this next one's pretty simple. It's very similar to what you do, did in lab this week, and some of you may be um, going to lab tomorrow, so that's okay, you'll get to it, but the idea here is that we've got some acid KHP, right? We've got KHP, and this is a known acid with a molecular weight, 204.22, and we've got a known mass, right? So that's important. So we can say KHP, and I'm just going to call this A uh, for shorthand for acid, and I know I've got some sodium hydroxide here, so sodium hydroxide, and this is going to react to give me water and a salt. And the salt here we can call, you know, if you want to, you can call it sodium A or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really matter, but all we care about here is that we have one mole of acid to one mole of base, and that's really important. It's a one-to-one -one ratio because that's critical for our, our ratio of acid to base, right? And so now we can do the calculation. We know that we've got 0 0.7250 grams of KHP, and we want to convert that to moles, and then we want to convert that to moles of base, divide it by the volume, and that gives us the concentration, the precise concentration. And we know that the molecular weight is 204.22 grams of KHP, 
and that's for every one mole of KHP. And then we know that since we did that hard work up here, one mole of KHP is equal to one mole of sodium hydroxide. And that's really, that's really, really important. And then you could stop there and find the moles, but it's really easy just to say, okay, grams KHP cancels grams KHP, moles KHP cancels moles KHP. What is, what is molarity? Moles per liter. So let's go ahead and just bring this down and do it in one calculation. I can convert milliliters to liters by dividing by a thousand. So three, four, six, five liters of sodium hydroxide and write moles over liters. That gives me molarity, which is zero point I get 0 0.1025 molarity for the sodium hydroxide. So that's really powerful, right? Because that can allow us to go from something that's very approximate by using a standard known amount of, a, of an acid and determine the precise concentration of a base. And we'll use this concentration in the step below. And so here we're going to take that value. I'm going to go ahead and write it down. We calculated that so uh, easily up above that we had the concentration of sodium hydroxide is 0 0.1025 molar, right? Sodium hydroxide. Now this problem is going to ask us to look at using this sodium hydroxide to calculate the molar mass in grams per mole. And notice that we're given the grams, so all we got to do is find the moles by using this known concentration of sodium hydroxide in this known amount that we used in the titration. So let's go ahead and write an equation just to make sure. So we'll call this acid HA. We're going to react it with sodium hydroxide. That's a neutralization reaction. We're going to form some water plus a salt, sodium A. Here we have acid and base. And again, the key thing here is just the ratio. One to one. We know it's monoprotic, has one hydrogen, going to react with one OH give us water and that salt and that's really really important just like we did up above one to one you gotta know the ratio or you're gonna get this wrong so in this case we'll take what we know which is our concentration of sodium hydroxide and again whenever I see the big M I'm gonna write moles per liter and I'm gonna go ahead and multiply this by what well I wanna get rid of I wanna find moles of acid so I want to get rid of the liters, and I have the volume up here. If I divide that by 1,000, I can get liters, so 0 0.04137 liters of sodium hydroxide, right? Okay, that means I've canceled my liters of sodium hydroxide. Now I want to go from one mole of sodium hydroxide to one mole of the acid HA and that's all we need to do. So if we calculate that I get 0 0.004240 moles of sodium hydroxide. Really really simple. Now I want to find the molecular mass that's going to be in grams per mole. Well uh, the grams were up here so 0 0.2571 grams over the moles, which is right here, 0 0.004240 moles. And if you do this, I get something like 60.64 grams per mole. Pretty simple, not that tough. There you go. The back page deals with our applications of equilibrium. Right, that was really important. We talked about equilibrium a lot in class, and so this first one says it's more of a conceptual question. We've got this uh, sulfur dioxide and some oxygen reacting in the environment. It's reversible reaction, right? So reversible. We've got the double arrow here, and it gives us sulfur trioxide. And here's really important: the Kc is given to you at a known temperature. And room temperature, we'll say I don't know, we'll say it's 25 degrees C or something like that. Um, so if you look at this, you can probably get a little hint. If, if they're kind of favored, if products and reactants are kind of favored equally at equilibrium, this value is going to be somewhere around one. But I would argue this is a really small number. So I'm guessing the reaction doesn't favor the products very much. It actually favors the, the reverse reaction. It favors the reactants. And so that's something you can know just by looking at the value that was given. Now this one says, does the reaction stop once it, once it reaches equilibrium? Well, the answer is certainly no, of course not. The idea is that 
um, for equilibrium, right? We have to think about what does that mean? Well, how do you know your equilibrium? Well, you know your equilibrium because you see no net change in the concentration of either the products or, or both the products and the reactants. Their, their concentrations will kind of level out and that's how you know you're at equilibrium. But just because we don't see anything doesn't mean nothing's happening. What equilibrium means is that once you get there, you don't see any net change because that means that the rate, the chemical reaction speed, the rate of the reaction in the forward direction equals the rate of the reaction in the backwards direction. And once that happens, your decomposing product just as fast as your synthesizing product at equilibrium so you don't see any net change in the concentration of this product and the same holds true for both reactants so I hope that helps you out so again is this this idea that even though it looks like nothing's happening again we call this what a dynamic equilibrium right that's really important dynamic equilibrium because just because it looks like nothing ha is happening is doesn't mean that's the case because again the reaction is going forward the reaction is going backwards but they're going at, at the same rate now this one's really easy write the expression for KC well KC is really easy you say it's the ratio of the concentrations in this case molarity the molar concentrations of the product SO3 and it has to be the concentration at equilibrium squared because of the coefficient all over the concentration of your reactant SO2 at equilibrium squared right because there's a coefficient of 2 there times the concentration of oxygen at equilibrium and again it's a 1 so you don't have to put the 1 there anything to uh, the 1 is itself so there you go now we can use this right and and I can go ahead and copy this down here just because we're gonna move the page down that number was given to us and it's 0 0.281 and that was given to you um, up above now if we look at this it says let's make a judgment call it says an empty flask at room temperature is filled with all these things calculate the Q and tell us what's gonna go on here and so that's what part D says so remember Q is the same algebraic form right in terms of raising the, pr the product uh, the product concentration times its uh, stoichiometric coefficient but it's not at equilibrium Q can be at any time and so here we have SO2 squared times the concentration of O2. That's pretty easy. Now we just plug them in. These all kind of look similar, so make sure that you're writing the right numbers down. So SO3 is 1.50 molarity squared all over, um, what do I have? The SO2 is 2.50 molar squared, and the oxygen is 2.50 molar and when you crank that out I get something on the order of 0 0.144 and now for part D we look at Q versus K right and I would argue that the Q is smaller than K which means in order for Q to go to K right if we're at one point or 0.144 we are not at equilibrium because we need to get to 2.8 once Q reaches the same value as K, you know you're at equilibrium. So we need that number to get bigger, and the only way to get bigger is to make more of this sulfur trioxide, which is product, which means the reaction must shift to products, right? It's got to shift in the forward direction so that Q can increase to become K so that you reach equilibrium. Pretty straightforward. All right, the last one here is a little bit of a, a thinking question that I think is pretty cool. So it says, okay, we've got this reaction where we're going to pass water, um, gas, hot steam over carbon graphite, right? And we're going to make carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. Pretty, pretty interesting reaction here. Now, what this is talking about is Le Chatelier, and we want to know we want to how to how can we think about maximizing the production? So we want to take this product. And we want to increase how much we can get using the idea of equilibrium, right? Because this is a reversible reaction and we want to take advantage of Le Chatelier. And the first thing I do is whenever I see something for uh, an equilibrium situation, I'm going to go ahead and write 
the equilibrium expression. So here I've got uh, carbon monoxide gas, right? And I don't know why that little control button is following me around. There you go, it's gone. Okay, now it's back. Oh, well, we'll deal with it later. And I'm going to multiply it by H2 gas. And then I'm going to go all over. Oh, and remember, that's at equilibrium. Let's not forget that. And then we're going to see here, we're going to have um, what? H2O at equilibrium. And these are all raised to the first power because the coefficients are all 1. But notice here. Do we put carbon here? Oh, no we don't, because carbon is a solid. Pure solids and pure liquids do not go in the equilibrium expression for the reasons we talked about in class or in your book. And so now we can do the problem. If we add water, if we add water here, to get back to equilibrium, it's going to have to shift to which direction? If we add water, it'll shift to the products and that helps us do what? That helps us increase the amount of hydrogen. So that is good. Carbon, if we added more carbon, guess what? It doesn't do anything because it's not in the equilibrium expression. So carbon has no effect. Now, increase or decrease pressure. Okay, this is a tricky one. We have two moles of gas, one, two moles of gas on the product side, only one mole of gas on the reactant side. So we'd want to decrease pressure to shift to the products because high pressure favors lowest number of moles so we don't want to increase the pressure that would go backwards so if we do that we get a shift uh, in the wrong direction so we'd rather decrease the pressure to go to the other side which has more moles of gas and that gives us of course more hydrogen easy enough and this last one talks about temperature and that's a little trickier, right? Because the reaction up above told us that it was endothermic. And if you have endothermic, heat is a reactant. You can kind of think of it that way. Technically, you'll learn more detail later on about what's actually happening to K as a function of temperature. However, in this case, to make it easy for this level, uh, we're going to think about heat as a reactant. So we're going to increase temperature so that we shift to the products, right? We're going to shift to the products and that will increase our H2 and we're all set. So pretty simple. I hope these have helped you prepare. I really hope that you build your confidence so you can do well on the exam and earn those points and feel confident about moving forward in the course. So uh, I hope this has helped and I'll see you later.